Welcome to UCF Nightline, your source for UCF sports and former player information. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley coming to you from the 1148 Studios. This is the Nightline Podcast, episode number 81. Joining me in studio is... Trey Strolko, just back from Miami and UCF's big 53-14 victory over FIU. Yeah, can you believe that? 53-14. A road win. Scott Frost's first road win as head coach of the Knights. UCF now 2-2 two and two on the season and conference play looms. Yeah, well, we get uh, East Carolina next week and that should be interesting. What you know, what's you, what fun after these games is you can break down stats, and I know you've been doing a great deal of number crunching, but how about this number? Six. Six rushing touchdowns for the Knights. Three for Dontravius Wilson. And uh, how about that Adrian Killens? Yeah, Wilson. He's, a, he's the flash. Yeah, yeah, Wilson had a great game, and Killens did. Absolutely. It's it's amazing when uh, Killens gets around the edge. He's gone. And it's, it's just gone. I mean, there's no there's no catching him. He's and, been caught a couple times, but not very many. And to be in the crowd, by the way, UCF fans outnumbered the FIU faithful. I feel bad for the FIU uh, program. They uh, That stadium holds 23,000, I believe. They announced 18 and change. That's not true. There were not 18,000 people in there, okay? UCF fans came out strong and loud. The band was there. And when Killens takes off, People rise out of their seats, and you can feel it. You can feel an electricity and an energy when he has the ball. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear what Scott Frost had to say about the win for the Knights. Another big improvement for our football team. I thought uh, we improved in all three phases. Um, we executed a lot better, did a lot of the little things right, and avoided some of the big mistakes. So uh, if we keep doing that, we're going to give ourselves some chance. I thought the backs did a really good job. Offensive line did an unbelievable job. And the defense played outstanding again to give us a lot of chance to score so it was a team win and i'm excited for these guys because they've been working for this we could feel it coming and, and they made it happen tonight all right well that was underneath the stands it and sounds it was... like a hundred thousand people were in that stadium yeah, based on the noise yeah. that's around uh, head coach frost interesting uh to talk a little bit more about our hawaiian punch hero mackenzie milton from last week uh ucf former ucf quarterback kyle israel will join us to talk about and break down more of what he saw and uh, i think a little of that involves Mackenzie's footwork he was sailing some passes early until he calmed down but really the story of this game don't you think just the running game and uh, the electricity that it creates absolutely before we talk about that real quick I want to say to everyone who called in last night on post game live it was absolutely awesome I had more phone calls than I knew what to do with. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, I, we have a new I talked about it a lot last night we have a new phone system courtesy of Vonage and uh, it's really cool. In fact, I've installed a new thing um, even since last night's show, and there's a there's a call queue now where it'll help me segregate the calls a little bit or, or get them you know more manageable for me. So when you call in, you'll be in line, and we'll get to take the calls in order and all that stuff. So I listened to it on the drive back from Miami, and uh, it sounded great. And you know what? I joined you a couple of times after the game. But to hear calls from Louisiana and Maryland and Ohio, Knights fans all across the country. Absolutely. One more thing I have to say about that phone system is you can go to our webpage, and on the left-hand side there is a little Vonage ad. Please click that. If you are if you have a business, Vonage, th these phone systems are so cool. You can control everything from your computer screen. Uh, you can... Uh, make all your own greetings and all that stuff and really, really set it up. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. So if you can help us out by grabbing a phone system from Vonage for your business and uh, we can make a little bit of money for the Nightline podcast as well, and we would greatly appreciate that. Treat anyway. for me is that I'm going to get to join you if all goes well uh, after the East Carolina game. I have been at Michigan and now FIU. I have not had an opportunity to watch a game with you. And East Carolina coming up, the uh, American opener on the road for UCF. Noon start uh, at Greenville. And then we'll be Nightline post game living it right after the game ends. What's your tagline? When the, when the clock expires, we go live. And you really do. On rabble.tv. Just reset your computer earlier this time. Well, I didn't you? do it. That was the thing. Yeah, last I came up here with about 
uh, about eight minutes left to go in the game just to get everything set up and make sure everything was in its place and everything was working. And my computer screen says, you know, we're doing an update, 15%. This could take a while. And when your computer screen says this could take a while, when Windows puts that up there, that's not a good thing. And it took, you know... I don't know what time I actually not started. Too, it wasn't bad. that bad, not but it bad. was definitely not when the clock expired. It was a little bit after that. So whatever. Uh, just hopefully my computer will not do try to do that again at that time because that was bad. I really like to be on time. I When I say I'm going to do something, I like to do it, and... I wasn't able to do it yesterday at that time. So, but I greatly appreciate it. it was it, it's a blast to have people calling in and talking about the game, especially when they're excited. Now, back to the game. People were a little excited yesterday, and I understand being excited. But <laughs> it you, was a win. You, you also a big win. It was it was a beating that we put on them. It was absolute shellacking. More than five hundred yards of total offense. But. FIU is an absolutely, probably one of the bottom-rung teams in Conference USA. We have to remember that. And in the country. Sunday's Miami Herald headline, FIU's loss makes us question when or if the Panthers program will arrive. And then we were greeted by Sunday's news that this, the game program, now a collector's item, page six, the Ron Turner bio, head coach of FIU, axed on uh, Wednesday, uh, on Sunday. Well... You know, that's another thing that we can be excited about because we beat them so bad that their head coach got fired. Yes. I mean, so... 0-4 oh start for him. Somebody on the message board earlier said he got frosted, which oh. I kind of like that, you know? So, I like that. Yeah. I, like, I, I have coined the term, he got griffoned on Twitter. <laughs> well, hashtag, he got griffoned. When, when uh, either one of the Griffin twins, you know, lays somebody out good or does something crazy... That's my hashtag, and feel free to use it. He got griffoned. What uh, about UCF'd? <laughs> yeah, well, I like Frosted. Whoever like Frosted. came up with that was a good... Uh, and there was a graphic which was a little bit too much, too graphic that somebody put on there. It was pretty bad, but anyway, I, I like that. So, yes, he definitely got Frosted, and he is gone. And, you know, I mean, he had a horrible streak there i mean he i think he won 10 games in three years or something like yeah, that not good. i mean the guy came from the nfl it, you don't always come to the nfl from the nfl and and do good in college look at charlie weiss at, at uh notre dame and kansas he had some success at the university of illinois back in the day and uh stints elsewhere but no not much success at uh fiu and meager turnout on the student uh student numbers they do some interesting things. The first 500 students, and I dare say I don't think they had 500, had an unlimited concessions opportunity with popcorn. And if you attend all of their home games as a student, you're entered into win. Uh, you're either entered into win or you get a tablet. Oh wow! I don't think they're giving out too many of those. So you could uh, you could get free popcorn though. Yes, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, free popcorn. Oh, oh. okay. I guess. Uh, you know, they must have some deal with uh, Orbel Redenbach or something. I don't know. <laughs> Is that's, he still that's, around? I don't know. But <laughs> it sounded good. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about this game a little bit. Of course, we're going to talk about it with Kyle later on. And, and his knowledge is always absolutely awesome. But you've been doing this, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly kind of thing. I'll just make this easy. There wasn't really anything ugly. There wasn't. Uh, no, no, let's let's focus in on the good. Uh, balanced attack, huh? 276 rushing yards, 225 passing yards. They ended up with 501 yards. That's pretty stout. All right. This is where I'm going to talk about um, these stats that you mentioned that I had been messing with earlier. I'm not a big stat guy. I don't like a lot of times do this, but today I had a little extra time on my hands while I was getting everything ready, and uh, I started looking... Some stat website, I just looked up, NCAA's wasn't current, so couldn't look there, but I looked up another one, and man, it, it had tons of information. So let's look at rushing. We've, we've talked about this for a couple weeks now, so rushing yards. Right now, we have got 943 rushing yards, pretty which good. is pretty good. Uh, our leader is Adrian Killens with 241 yards, Dontravius Wilson uh, is... You know, a little bit behind him, 205, and Jawan Hamilton just hammering the ball 
Jawan the Hammer Hamilton is what I want to call him. Hammer Hamilton. Yes, that is my new name for him right off the top of my head there. With 179 yards, but those 179 yards are mostly right up the middle and uh, just hammering it. I mean, that's he is awesome. And hopefully he came up a little bit uh, injured. Hopefully he's getting – I know he's getting an MRI and stuff tomorrow. We will – let's just hope that he is able to continue and uh, – you know, we need him, even though you, last night showed that we have a bunch of running backs, stable of running, a backs. stable. Absolutely. And it's a good stable, too. So you, you feel better, though, that if he does need to miss some time and hopefully it's not serious, um, we really don't know at this point. I think he's going to miss step some, in. I think he's going to miss some time. I do. But yes, there are other people to step in. OK, so. Speaking of, all right, so I'm going to go back to uh, 943 yards for this year so far. Let's go back to last year real quick, where C.J. Jones was the leader of the rushing, and all he got all year long was 339 yards. He was the, our rushing leader. Taj McGowan got 262 yards, and Dontravius Wilson 147 yards. Now, if you take all the rest of the people that ran the ball last year, were quarterbacks and, you know, uh, people like that, we had 975 yards rushing For 12 last full year. games. For tw- all year. So, if you go back to the page before, 943 <laughs> yards so far this year. In four, four games. games. And in 12 games last year, we had 975 yards in rushing. To my point a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. is, wow. I mean, the rushing is really going. And, I mean, honestly, possibly we could have a 1,000-yard rusher. Uh, they got to turn it on here pretty quick. But I think, honestly, if Hamilton is out this week and they give it to Killens a lot more, I think that he's going to really, really turn it on because he's, you know, he's, he's starting to get uh, it going. And it's working with him going around the end, and they're long, long runs. In these stats that you compiled, then, there are two good contrasts as well in that, that UCF's averaging 4.47 yards per rush compared to last year's 2.74, and they have 11 touchdowns right? versus four all of last year. And Adrian Killens is averaging 15 yards a carry. <laughs> That's crazy. Which is a ton. Yeah. And that throws that off a little bit. But last year, uh, C.J. Jones averaged 3.65. Taj McGowan averaged 3.08. Don Travius Wilson a little bit better than Taj McGowan at 3.34. But the offensive line, obviously... Obviously, obviously, has gotten a lot better. And our running backs are, are, you know, I mean, some of those guys are still the same people. But if you see what Dontravius Wilson is doing already this year with five touchdowns, that's, you know, that's pretty impressive. And he is a big dude. And he's the, you know, the third down the when you need to get the, you know, pounded in there, the end zone guy. So he's going to have a lot of the touchdowns. But uh, it's kind of interesting how Scott Frost, Coach Frost, has made, you know, definitely roles for these running backs. And I, I hope it doesn't get, you know, too messed up if Hamilton has to sit out for a couple weeks or whatever. But hopefully he is not hurt, you know, too too badly. Uh, I know it's something with the knee, and uh, let's just cross your fingers, you know, cross your toes, you know, hope to God that... Uh, He's okay. Yeah, Dontravius Wilson, I think, has been an early season surprise. Three rushing touchdowns, as you pointed out during Nightline postgame live, that equaled uh, Storm Johnson's three touchdowns and a half uh, in the 2014 Fiesta Bowl. I also thought interesting that, um, you know, I guess I didn't realize it as much in the stands, but none of UCF's scoring drives lasted longer than three minutes. Did that, it's hard to believe that, Uh yeah, it was moving fast for sure. They're averaging 83 plays a game uh, now through four games. That's, That's a, lot. a market improvement from, yeah. from last year. Yeah, I'm looking through my thing. I, You know, I had to have lost some stuff because uh, I had a lot of paper here. In translation? Oh, wait, maybe this is it. Is this it? Uh, 
I can't find my I, – I had rushing stats from this year and last year – or receiving stats from this year and last year. Do you have that in your packet, by I the way? I will by share, the, you, share with you my packet. All right, let me look, take in, a look at in that. that one real quick. I'll throw out a couple of others that I jotted down during the game notes. Uh, no turnovers. That was a big improvement from the Maryland game the week before with the number of fumbles that UC have had that contributed to that loss. A play of the tight ends, I thought that stood out. And uh, how about that two-point conversion? On the first touchdown, uh, Scott Frost and the offensive coordinators, they really try to make a, uh, a stand right off the top. And we that. talked about that last night as well, that that has to be a thing that you do to throw people off. You have to do it every once in a while and succeed at it to people to make people, you know, worry when you try it, number one. If you try it and every time you fail, then, you know, it's it's not going to make anybody first worry. First successful one. one this season. I don't know about that. I think we might have had another one, but maybe not. Um, anyway, and it's, you know, I guarantee you whoever's watching the film from that game is going to, you know, be weary of us doing that. But you never know. So you never know if the kicker is going to go out there and actually kick the ball or they're going to throw it or run it or, or we're going to line up in just a two-point, you know, play. And do it. You never know. Fake field goals are coming, I'm sure. You don't know what to expect. How about the opposing team when they look at the film and they go, they went for fourth and one on their own 11? Absolutely. They're unpredictable. Absolutely. Right? But you don't know what to expect. That's the beauty of the entire thing. You've got to keep them guessing. And this offense absolutely 110% keeps everybody guessing. And Scott Frost, with his play calling, keeps everybody guessing. He learned from one of the best. You know, Chip Kelly, he learned from, if not the best, you know, doing all this stuff. So it it, it is what it is, and, and we have to get used to this brand of football. I'm uh, getting used to it. It's yeah. I I have no problem getting used to it. <laughs> it's just going to – It's I know it's confusing to a lot of people, though. It's confusing to me. I'm learning more and more about it every week, but – I've talked before how it was confusing. A couple of weeks ago on Post Game Live, we I was talking with a guy and not really understanding how this whole thing worked. And now I'm starting to get it a lot more. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping the rest of the fans out there are starting to get it and appreciate it. Because it's it's a thing of beauty once it uh, it gets going. Yeah, and we really should at this point credit the defense for uh, stepping up. They limited FIU to 11 first downs, UCF offensively 26 first downs. They limited FIU to 189 yards. And as you know, some of that was uh, garbage and total offense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the uh, their early score came on that uh, you know, line drive punt returned and then a short touchdown run. But the defense really put a shutdown on them. Right, and this is one of those things as well that people need to understand about this defense, which is a little bit different than George O'Leary's defenses of years past. This is more, I think George O'Leary did use the, the, the phrase, bend, don't break. But this is much more of a bend, don't break defense as far as the way that it works. Um and every once in a while, it will break. And every once in a while, there's going to be a jailbreak like on that touchdown last night. I didn't, honestly, I didn't even see the second one because I think I was dealing with computers and, and it, the one in garbage time that they, I don't even know how they scored it, to be honest with uh, you. We had a defender fall down, uh, slip in the end zone, and it left a wide open wide okay. receiver. Right. So, but at that point, and you said and it doesn't uh, matter i mean I, I can't i think you said it to me on nightline post game live that uh there were so many people that you didn't even know their names and it's something Kyle says yeah. coming up when he uh, when he uh joins us for there the were, breakdown yeah there were players that i had never heard of before i i mean i'd seen their names on the roster but i don't think i'd ever seen them on the field and no. who would have ever thought that we were going to see Pete DeNovo at quarterback <laughs> yeah Pete DeNovo yeah. I mean, I honestly, after the debacle in Ireland with him, I never thought we would ever see him on the field besides being a wide receiver. Definitely not a quarterback. And credit to Nick Patty, who came in and did exactly what you needed him to do and directing the offense, uh, he mopping did what, up for, uh, you know, McKenzie. He did it perfectly. He did exactly what he was supposed to do and did it perfectly. So. And you have said this over and over again. This is a game that you got to go in and you got to put a whooping on them. And yep. they did. And uh, Finally. you got to keep it tempered. They're 2-2 two and two after four games. 
you thought going in. You get that win with South Carolina State. You get that win on the road at FIU. Remember, this is an FIU team that, believe it or not, boy, it's still hard to believe, defeated UCF at Bright House 15-14 last year. Back to norm there in defeating them in the form and the fashion in which UCF did. And Michigan, you know, uh, there were some things to, to, to come out of that and be positive about. And we know that Maryland game was within reach. And Well, if you wouldn't have had the – the five or whatever turnovers yeah. in that Maryland game. That's a winnable game. Easily. Easily. We probably would have put a whooping on them, to be honest with you. So if nothing we would have be scored, embarrassed about at two and two. Think about this. If we would have scored in the Maryland game every time we fumbled or, or lost the ball, what would the score have been? Yeah, much more. Yeah. Would, would have avoided overtime. I honestly think if Mackenzie Milton would have been playing quarterback, we would have looked a hell of a lot better against Michigan, to be mm. honest with you. Because that's a to- he's a totally different dude out there running around, and uh, supposedly he went out, you know, and and had a little ankle thing. But I have heard uh, that uh, I'm not naming sources or anything, but I've heard that he is a okay and he will be good. I will say that I'm not going to say anything about anything else that I know, but I will say that I think Mackenzie Milton is going to be okay for next week. Yeah. Mackenzie looked fine. You know, doctors huddled around him. I could see him from where we were seated. And uh, then he was standing on the sideline, a little gimp, you know, but nothing serious. No one was particularly bothered. By I took a little him. long pause when in that sentence, but that was uh, because I was trying to decide whether I was going to say that or not, but eh, that one's good. I can, I can talk about that. Expect Milton to be uh, to be fine. You know, back on the Michigan game, and you mentioned perhaps a bit of a change in quarterback might have resulted something different. I looked up Michigan's stats on the running. UCF still rushed for the most yards, and they've since played Colorado and Penn State. And Absolutely. UCF put up the 275 right. rushing yards. Right. So through four games, it's UCF who's put up the most rushing against Remember Michigan. how people thought that this was going to be this pass-happy, crazy thing? And what do we keep telling everybody? It's a run-heavy offense. It's a run-heavy offense. It's a run-heavy offense. And boy, have they taken that and run with it. That's a perfect segue right there. I'll tell you what. You know, we're going to have Kyle Israel stopping by to dig deeper into this and talk a little bit more about the quarterback play of Mackenzie Milton because that becomes even more important now as they travel to Greenville, North Carolina for the first American Conference game of the year. And we've got an East Carolina insider who's going to tell us where East Carolina is strong on both sides of the ball and where UCF will have opportunity, hopefully, to exploit. Plus, Andrew, your favorite segment in the world. What in the world is going on with the Big 12 expansion? Hmm. All right, let's hear from our insider. Five questions with an insider. Getting to know this week's opponent. The rivalry between East Carolina and UCF heats up again this coming Saturday in Greenville, North Carolina. Joining us now for a look at the Pirates is Whitey Martin, who keeps tabs on all things East Carolina at the American Athletic Conference's fans page on Facebook. Whitey, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for asking. Well, props to East Carolina for tough scheduling. You know, it's September featured a win over North Carolina State, but back-to-back losses, South Carolina, and this past weekend, Virginia Tech, a 54-17 loss to the Hokies. Where are the Pirates after the first month of the season? Well, uh, South Carolina game really disappointed us. We outplayed them in every phase of the game, except uh, we have two weaknesses, um, th- really three weaknesses in our team. One, we've been having we have been having problems in the red zone. Uh, that has really killed us. And our special team, has, I mean, I don't even know the words to use for our special teams. They're about as bad as they come. Uh, I mean, uh, we've had a kickoff return, a punt return, you know, uh, the opening of the games, and that just puts us uh, our backs against the wall from the beginning. Uh, and our third problem we're having is the deep pass. Now, in, our, in my opinion, uh, I noticed UCF uh, has a stable of uh, running backs uh, that look pretty good. Uh, that, to me, I think that's our strong suit is stopping the run more so than the pass, especially the deep pass. But uh, where we are after the, after the fourth game, well, if anybody asked at the beginning of the season, I think most of us would hope that we would come out two and two, which that's where we were. Well, I mean, where we are. But uh, the thing is that I, I cannot believe that we let 
Virginia Tech completely slaughter us. I mean, they beat us to death. <laughs> but uh, so going against you, I'm pretty nervous. Could be interesting. We definitely have a running game. Uh, tell us more about the Pirates quarterback, Philip Nelson, and his targets at wide receiver. Now, that's where I'm very impressed. I mean, uh, he, he, now he did have some problems in the red zone uh, against South Carolina, but uh, I love the, love how he passes. In fact, uh, he's got one of the prettiest passes I've seen from any quarterbacks we have. Well, take that back. Jeff Blake was pretty good, and so was David Gerard. But uh, he's got a beautiful pass. In fact, uh, we had two deep passes against Virginia Tech that was right on the money, but they were dropped, you know. Um, and that's another thing that we have lost uh, one of our deep threat for the season. So if it wasn't for his passing, we probably wouldn't even uh, have an offense. But uh, our offense is, uh, I'm not afraid of our offense at all, that I, I think our offense can move against anybody. What about the running game then? Now, running game, uh, it's ifs and ends with the running game. Uh, uh, Sometimes it looks like we got some great running power, and then the other times we can't even get a yard. You know, uh, we've been depending the, against Virginia Tech. We depended on Summers, which was our quarterback for last year, and they just stuffed him at the line. Uh, and he's pretty good. Now, Scott, I love how Scott runs, but uh, he had a tendency of uh, fumbling the ball. And uh, he's got to take care of that. But uh, if he gets in the open field, he, he can take off. So you mentioned uh, stopping the run earlier. What's your sense of the uh, defense heading into conference play? I like our defense. Now, uh, we have a great nose guard, McGill, uh, who got injured last week. I hope he gets to play. Uh, I haven't really heard yet if he'll be able to play against you. But uh, I kind of like our defensive line, and I, I kind of like the speed of our linebackers. Uh, it's our defensive backs that uh, lets a few people get behind them. And uh, other than that, I, I, I like our defense pretty much. Well, you know, Knights versus Pirates, it's a rivalry that dates back to Conference USA play. But, you know, it's really been one-sided, uh, quite honestly. The Pirates holding the edge 10-4 against the Knights. Do you look at UCF as uh, East Carolina's most heated rival? Oh, yes. Yes. In fact, uh, I tell that to a lot of people, especially uh, you've seen me on the message board. Uh, yes, I uh, I think very much that UCS is a rival of us. In fact, uh we kind of get jealous because of your location. Being in Orlando, all the conference extension talks, they kind of always bring you in and leave us behind. <laughs> you mentioned the uh, fan page. Why don't you tell folks uh, about that that may not be aware of the uh, Americans' uh, fan page on uh, on Facebook? Yeah, uh, well, it was started uh, when ESPN took the American Athletic Conference off their blog. Uh, somebody kind of suggested, so why don't you uh, start uh, a, a Facebook page with it? And he says, uh, we can get a lot of people. And believe it or not, uh, hitting 3,000 people in three years, we've done pretty good. And, uh, I mean, like last week, as you saw, uh, we reached uh, almost 200,000, 189,000 at one, th one day. So, uh I think it's catching on, but uh, like most people have told me, that a uh, Facebook page to really take off usually takes about five years. So uh, we're getting there. I like it. How do y'all like it? I think it's awesome. We post on there constantly, and it's been a big supporter of, of what we do here with Nightline, and uh, we really appreciate that you started that, and it's, it's absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on and talking to us we like you and uh hopefully one of these days we'll make it up there and be able to meet you in person well i told you if uh, any of you ever decide to come to an east carolina home game uh you got a place to stay save you a hotel room well that goes for you as well thank you very much
thanks, my man, and y'all y'all take care. And uh, may the best team win, which I hope it's East Carolina. Go Pirates. <laughs> Absolutely. All righty. There are so many ways to connect with Nightline. Check out our website at UCFNightlinePodcast.com for recruit spotlights, archived episodes, and more. You can like us on Facebook at Nightline Podcast. Talk with us on Twitter at UCF underscore Nightline. Listen whenever and wherever you are on YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, or TuneIn. Call us with your questions or comments at 407-401-9184. That's 407-401-9184. Go Nightline. Lights charge on. Welcome to Inside the Huddle with former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel, brought to you by the Little Greek Fresh Grill. Fresh, flavorful, fabulous water for lakes, 855 North Alfea Trail, Orlando. Let's break down uh, UCF's road win at FIU with former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel, who stops by Nightline to talk about a victory. A nice change of pace for you, Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the first time and now uh, one in a quarter seasons that I've been on the, the Nightline and been able to, to talk about a victory. So I'm certainly pleased and a, and a great victory, uh, explosive victory at that. Yeah, so what did you think? We scored, what, 53 points and uh, and really turned it on. I mean, it was a little crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the thing that I'm most, you know, kind of astonished by and pleased to see is just how many guys are getting touches and how many guys are, uh, are, are playing extremely well with the ball in their hands. I mean, I think we didn't really know what we had at the running back position going into the season. Um, I think it's clear that we have three or four guys back there um, obviously, the question mark with Jawan Hamilton and, and the injury, but you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not concerned in regards to the running main because of what we do have back there. I think when you look at you know our offense, we put up a ton of points, but honestly, our defense is what's what's most remarkable to me. Guys seem to be flying all over the field, uh, getting pressure on the quarterback, and and really kind of setting the tone for the ball game. And that came from our defense last night. So it, it definitely looked like this is a game where we really put it all together, and we'll see if we can carry that momentum on in, into conference play. So much to appreciate in this uh, decisive win over the Panthers, but if we can nitpick a little bit on Nightline, let's talk a a bit about Mackenzie Milton. 8 of 14 for 173 yards. No turnovers, but what do you see with him? Uh, There was a little early frustration on the part of the fans at FIU where I was down for the game uh, that, you know, he wasn't setting his feet and he was sailing balls. What do you see in him? Yeah, I mean, I saw the same thing. I, I think that when you see some different camera angles from the game, um, on television, you could you could kind of see it from behind McKenzie, and just looked like the ball was coming out of his hand funny, and wasn't really pulling it down, and kind of you know getting the velocity on it, and then those balls were sailing, even the ones that were completed. The receivers were needing to make great catches to do that. I think that he needs to become more consistent in that regard, uh, because high, high high footballs are dangerous. Those lead to interceptions. Those lead to uh, laying your wide receivers out, and, and that's something you want to try to avoid uh, and work on, certainly, in practice. Um, but you did see a little bit of what we hope to see in the future with McKenzie uh, with his scrambling ability and playmaking skills. Obviously, his his pass of over 30 yards to Jordan Aikens down there for a touchdown, it seemed like that play was dead, and then he kind of twirls out of there back to his right and uh, and finds Aikens, who made a phenomenal catch getting his foot. Uh, inbounds, and so I think that, you know, although it probably wasn't the game McKenzie wanted to have all around, you know, we were going to put so much pressure on that FIU defense with the running game that it almost didn't matter what we did at the quarterback position. Anybody could have almost been in there as long as they were able to uh, to move the ball and disperse it to, to the playmakers on the outside and in the backfield. You talk about the need for continued improvement for McKenzie. Question for you, is it how much he takes coaching during the week, or is it repetitions or just a combination of things that he needs to do to continue to improve his game? Well, I mean, it's always going to be all of those things. I mean, you're hoping these guys are taking coaching. You know, I I think that the relationships that he seems to have with Coach Frost, although I don't know it 
personally, but uh, through the recruiting process and, and through the camps at Oregon and then having the, the kind of trust to come over here all the way basically to the other side of the world uh, to play for Coach Frost, I'm sure that he's, he's getting coaching from him and, and our quarterback's coach. Um, and, and I think that those are areas that he's going to improve. But, you know, it is difficult playing when you're young. And, uh, you know, I, I think that you need to be extremely, extremely focused and, and uh you know, on point each and every game, each and every player, or be your best, you know, do do it to your best ability to, to stay focused. And it almost looked like he came out there last night. It's not fair for me to judge whether he was focused or not, but just not sharp, uh, whether it was the lackluster environment or the kind of letdown in regards to the, the style of play compared to a home game in front of 44,000 people, 42,000 against Maryland compared to going down to FIU. I don't know. It could be a number of things, but – uh, you know, I, I think that we're going to see games like this when you start a true freshman, up and down, up and down, uh, and he's going to have some bright moments and he's going to have some true freshman moments, and the key is to not let those moments that he's having a true freshman bad moment uh, kind of hurt you in the overall scope of the game. Yeah, I don't know if you heard it, but during halftime, um, Donovan McNabb was on their halftime show, and he was absolutely ripping Mackenzie Milton's throwing motion and the way that he releases the ball. And he was ripping uh, Coach Verduzco as well, which was really interesting. Donovan McNabb is Donovan McNabb, and, he, you know, he's done a lot of things, but I don't know how close, you know, he is to any of this. So I thought that was kind of weird, you know, for him to be doing that. I, you probably didn't hear it, though, because you said that you were out. So I just thought yeah, that it was very I, interesting. I did not hear it, no. Yeah. McKenzie does have a little bit of a sidearm thing when he releases when he throws the ball, you know, and he he kind of uh, almost baseball pitches the ball uh, in a way. I don't know how you could if you could break down his uh, throwing motion at all and what you know or about that. You know, I don't know that I could do do much of an analysis really from what I've seen thus far with the naked eye. It's something you'd you'd want to see more up close, but it is different. You know, and, and he's a different type of quarterback. We don't have a six foot two, six foot three, big, you know, two hundred and twenty pound quarterback sitting up there in the pocket. I mean, uh, I think that he kind of looks like he's throwing darts more than he is has a big wind up. If you try to compare, I don't know, on the same team, Justin Holman to McKenzie, you know, Justin more of a little bit of a wind up, and McKenzie kind of looking like he's throwing a dart. Uh, I, I think those are all things uh, that that he can improve on and will naturally improve on, but. It's not a bad thing to have a guy that can drop his arm down in multiple uh, angles and positions to deliver the football. I mean, those are those are the hard things to teach. So if we know he can do that, then kind of finding that that comfort zone in regards to when he really needs to put the football in there, you know, will will kind of work themselves out. But you also got to consider it being at five eleven. Uh, you you know the way that you see the game and the way that you see the field is different than somebody that's that's six two or six three. It just flat out is, and your balls come in. Uh, off your hand five inches lower than, you know, a bigger quarterback potentially. And you, sometimes you feel like you got to do some things to move that arm slot around. So uh, I'm not too concerned with that. I wouldn't put too much uh, emphasis on where that, you know, what his throwing motion is now because there's so many other parts of the game that you want to get him up to speed on uh, and kind of let his throwing motion uh, come into its own. But I wouldn't put a ton, ton of emphasis on it at this point in time in the season. When I uh, joined Andrew from Miami on the Nightline Post Game Live, uh, Andrew asked me last night, what did I think uh, biggest surprises so far in the first couple of weeks? And I said, I thought the offensive and defensive line play has really stood out. What, what are your thoughts on those? I, you know, I think that's a great observation, Trace. For me, it's one of the most, uh, you know, biggest points of emphasis when I look at this team and where you can see the improvement. Um, and, and I'm, you know, frankly, I'm, to be completely candid, I'm still learning a lot of those guys' names. Uh, up front on both sides of the ball. Um, and I think that those are names that are going to become more popular with the fan base as, as time goes on. But last year you just didn't feel like, from the offensive line perspective, there was a lot a lot of push at the line of scrimmage and attack at the line of scrimmage. And we always kind of just seem to be kind of like in a rugby style of play where we're just kind of moving the line forward a little bit here and there. But this year in this offense – the offensive line is doing an incredible job of getting to the second level, getting to linebackers. Uh, you know, you see Adrian Killens get around the corner and, and, and barely get touched, and you got a will, you got a, a, a tackle or a guard working up to the will linebacker and backer blocking him downfield. I mean, we just didn't see that number one type of effort. Obviously, number two, the type of scheme 
Uh, and I think this scheme definitely can help out our offensive line. So uh, it, it's extremely improved. Defensively, you know, our defensive line is doing a lot of great things that don't always end up in a sack or a tackle for loss. Uh, but you see a lot of success from our linebackers and blitzes. Um, Shaquem Griffin, notably, who had a phenomenal game last night and just really starting to come into his own, and I'm extremely happy to see that, uh, the growth that he's had. But the defensive line has done a lot of great uh, things in, in, in just taking gaps away, uh, taking on two blockers so a linebacker can come free, uh, and then helping get some inside pressure uh, that's not allowing these quarterbacks to step up. So when Griffin uh, comes off the edge, that quarterback is forced backwards in the pocket and not up and through. So I think that that is for sure the most improved part of our team uh, is the front uh, five on both sides. And uh, I think that's where we needed to see improvement if we were going to have any success this year because we knew that we had some skill players on the outside that could make plays for us. You know, uh, all this is interesting, especially talking about the offense. I looked up a bunch of stats today, and it's not something that I do a lot of times, but I kind of went back and looked at last year and looked at this year. And uh, so far, right now, people are still bringing up Justin Holman's name, of course. And they were surprised that we didn't see him last night. I'm not even sure that he traveled. I didn't. I didn't see him on the sideline ever. They never, you know, looked over at him or anything. But uh, they've both played two games this year. Uh, Mackenzie Milton actually has 433 yards compared to Justin's 212 yards this year, uh, and a completion attempt, you know, yards per attempt 8.7 versus Justin Holman's 5.4. How much does does uh, Mackenzie Milton's style and just everything that he does out there, it makes such a big difference. What are the, the big differences between those two guys, and, and why does it do that? Well, you would, you would assume that with the offense that we're running, I'm not sure Justin Holman, and, and this isn't a negative remark towards Justin whatsoever, I'm not sure he's a guy Coach Frost would have recruited to fit this style of play, and that's okay. There's a lot of guys that don't fit into this style of play at the quarterback position. And there's a lot of incredible quarterbacks uh, that, you know, are very successful outside of this style. Um, so I, I think when you look at McKenzie and, and from a play calling perspective, he probably has more opportunities to make more plays that highlight him and, and end up in statistics for him than what a Justin Holman in this style of offense. So uh, I think that's one because of McKenzie's elusiveness uh, ability to run, uh, you know, if you go back and watch these plays, you know, for example, a simple option play, McKenzie Milton does things with the football in his hand on a simple option where he's only carrying it about four yards before he pitches. But the way that he runs, moves his body, and manipulates the ball while it's in his hand sets up a whole lot more space on the outside um, when he pitches it to the running back. And he did that one play last night to the right on an option, um, and, and it ended up he pitched it and ended up in about a 20 or 25-yard touchdown, I believe. And so if you've seen that play, then you, you know what I'm talking about. And, it, and it's that kind of – it's kind of that comfort with the ball in your hand and never looking like you're rushed. It's all fluid. And, and you know, that aspect of the game, to not have to coach that and for a guy to have that naturally – is crucial. And so I think when you look at all those things together, Justin Holman, to me, in this offense, I think he's a little bit more, um, you know, just a little bit stiffer than a quarterback that would be very successful in this style offense. Not to say Justin's not a great athlete, that he can run and has that ability, uh, but there's kind of a wiggliness, and that's, I don't even know that's a word, but I hope you know what I mean. (laughs) It's kind of like, you know, a, 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 a guy's way to move his body uh, and I'm starting to sound, you know, not make sense here. But no, the way that a guy moves his body and his comfort, you know, I, I think is important. We understand what you're saying. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. The yeah. word of the day is wiggliness. So yeah, wiggliness. Like wiggliness. Uh, let's like shift uh, <laughs> real quick over to defense. You know, after four games, UCF's 2-2, two and two, and I think most Knights fans would have said, boy, we're probably going to get that South Carolina State FIU game. Michigan's going to be hard. Maryland, we'd like to be in it, and we were. 
but conference play begins. Talk about the animal that is conference play. The intensity uh, kicks up a notch. And also what you might expect from uh, the defense against an East Carolina team that so far has played NC State to a win, South Carolina right to the end, and then got blown out versus Virginia Tech. But those are three strong non-conference opponents that have gotten East Carolina ready for conference play. Yeah, absolutely. And conference play is a beast. I mean, the American Athletic Conference has really good football programs. Um, you know, we all we our focus has been on bigger and and greener pastures and and dollar signs with the Big Twelve. But inside of our conference, there's very very good football uh, that is played. And, and and East Carolina has shown you that they are a good football team. I mean, they have a great environment in, in their hometown and in their stadium. That place sells out, and it is loud, and it is a very uh, Big time college football atmosphere. I've played games there. You you got to really win every week with the caliber of our opponents in this conference. Obviously, you know we were at the bottom of the conference last year, and so conference. I, I do like what Coach O'Leary used to say, and I think Coach Frost shares the same sentiment, which is really just take it one game at a time because uh, you're just going to drive yourself crazy if you try to look down the road and play and look at scenarios, etc. But it is crucial, and I feel good about where we are. You know, we, we I think that we could have won that Maryland game, like you said, Trace, or at least be in it. I think that we're kind of really meshing and gelling together as a team at the right time in the way that we won over FIU. I, you know, I can't remember a game in recent memory where at halftime I felt really comfortable about where our team was and the potential of us winning the game. And so I kind of, you know, I feel good about where we are, but it is going to be tough. East Carolina is going to be a tough opponent. Um, anybody out there that thinks that uh, we're going to kind of just, you know, put it in overdrive and, and run through the conference, I, I think they have other things coming. These are going to be tough games, but these also are going to be good tests for us and good tests to see where we're at. And I'm excited about it. I mean, obviously we get to play Houston down the road. There's a lot of payback that I'd like to get from last season, notably UConn, obviously USF. You know, our, our conference has a lot of good games uh, to be played in, and I'm excited about it. Absolutely. I know you've been busy this week. What's going on at the Little Greek? Well, more of the same this week. I mean, September see, is supposed to be a slow time of the year, but it has not been slow for us. Um, so we've been extremely pleased. I know that we have a lot of UCF fans and alumni, students, that really support us. So for any of you, any of you that do stop by Little Greek, uh, you know, firsthand, I'm telling you, we we absolutely appreciate the support. Our first year in three months has been phenomenal. Um, so we're just looking to 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 find more franchisees, open more locations. Um, if there's anybody out anybody out there listening to to the podcast tonight that ever thought about being their own boss or or getting into a, a franchise and the benefits uh, of being a part of, especially a young and growing franchise, uh, please certainly reach out to me uh, on Facebook or, or, or in some manner, and, and I'd love to talk to you more about it. But that's, that's what we're looking at right now is expansion and growth. All righty. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us again. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys, and uh, look forward to, like you said, uh, Trey's conference play in the next couple of weeks and then homecoming uh, two weeks from now. All right. We will hopefully see you out there, and we will talk to you soon. Okay. Sounds good, guys. Take Thanks. it easy. Coast to coast. And even north of the border in Canada. Hello, Night Nation. I'm Andrew Fegley. I'm Trey Strolko. Tell your friends about Nightline Post Game Live. It's the only place to talk about UCF's latest road game as soon as the game ends. We're taking your calls live, so save our number, 407-401-9184. That's 407-401-9184. Join the conversation with Knights fans across the country. Download the Rabble.tv app today and listen in. Remember, when the clock expires, we go live. Nightline Post Game Live, your place to talk about football with two of the biggest UCF fans around. Go Knights! Charge on! You know, I followed the American on Twitter. They had a post on Sunday reading American ranks fourth in non conference winning percentage at 700, only behind the SEC, the Big Ten, and the ACC. That's pretty good. Uh, certainly ahead of that other conference, that Big 12 conference. Uh, best win of the week, how about Tulane? Uh, of all teams, Tulane, uh, the 41-39 win over UL Lafayette and four overtimes. Other big winners in the American. Tulsa knocked off Fresno State in double overtime. Memphis, 77 points on Bowling Green. Houston won again. Cincinnati Temple also with wins. My favorite loser of the week, the Cows. They got throttled uh, by the, the Seminoles. 
Did you listen or watch any of that game? I did. Yeah, how about that? First play, South Florida touchdown. I didn't, I didn't see that, but I First play for it, Florida yeah. State, touchdown. Now, that's a lot of uh, points in a short period of time. Uh, the uh, SMU lost to TCU. UConn lost to seven by Syracuse. Virginia Tech, as we talked with the insider, cruised past East Carolina 54-17. So some big games coming up in the American in the uh, the next week. UConn at Houston, SMU at Temple, Navy takes on Air Force. Memphis travels to number 23 Old Miss. That's when I'm a big Memphis fan. And the Cows are on the road at Cincinnati. So how about Cincinnati wins, knock the Cows out of the race, and then they don't really have anything to play for. Absolutely. You like I, that? I did see the uh, SMU-TCU game the other night. Cause they it hung was, with them for it a was while. on Friday, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I fell asleep at one point, I think. It was, <laughs> a, little, that, yeah, it was a little draft. <laughs> yeah. What's happening this week? Taking a look at your Nightline Planner. Women's soccer hosts Houston Thursday, September 29th, 7 o'clock. SMU 1 o'clock on Saturday, October 1. Both matches at the UCF Soccer Complex. Volleyball on the road now in the American play at East Carolina for Friday, September 30, Cincinnati, Sunday, October 2. Women's tennis tangles with the cows at the Bedford Cup in Tampa. That begins Friday, September 30. Seminole State College of all teams coming to UCF Softball Complex Friday, September 30, 5 o'clock. Fall ball gets underway for UCF Softball. Palm Beach Atlantic against the Knights on Saturday, October 1 at 11 a.m. And then Florida Southwestern at 3 p.m. on that Saturday. Schools that I am not very familiar with. Women's golf off to Charleston, South Carolina for the Cougar Classic beginning Sunday, October 2. As the world turns. Our theme music on the latest on Big 12 expansion. ESPN.com asked the question in a column this week, will anything really happen when the Big 12 meetings get underway October 17th? Uh, how about this quote in the article? Just this week, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick told KRIV-TV in Houston that, quote, this is about Texas schools. I don't really give a hoot and a holler about UConn or some school in Florida or anywhere else. Texas schools ought to vote for other Texas schools. Our team hasn't talked about it one time. We're not going to talk about it. I, you know, this guy is absolutely a loser. Uh, I don't even know who. The lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor, obviously. I mean, you He's know. He's pro-Houston, Yeah, obviously. I mean. But it's that dig at the. Uh, whatever. Some school in Florida. Is this Dan Patrick, the ESPN no, guy? No, no. Different Dan Patrick. I know. I'm just, I'm playing. But whatever. Uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, Texas, you've got enough. I mean, <laughs> Texas, you've, got, you've enough. got enough. It's just period. <laughs> I like that rationale. I still like what uh, Scott Frost says. Our say. team hasn't talked about it one time. We're not going to talk about it. How long uh, is that sound bite? Is that about five seconds? I don't know. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's like whatever. It's two seconds, but two seconds. it's all good. So that's that's it. We don't need to talk about that anymore. That's what we've covered it for the week. Absolutely. What about nights in the NFL? Uh, Blake, boy, what is going on with the Jaguars? Well, they're 0-3 now. Horrible. And when Blake Bortles, with 17 rushing yards, is your leading rusher, maybe faulting his quarterback play is not the best thing. But uh, I know two, that running backs aren't nearly as important in the NFL, they say, anymore. Yeah, but, but Lord, still, you need mercy. more than that. Two touchdowns, three interceptions. Jags fell to 0-3 last minute, Nineteen seventeen loss to the Ravens. I got a thing over my phone because I subscribed to the uh, the Jaguars uh, ESPN you know quotes and stuff. Gus Bradley still has faith. Quarterback Blake Bortles says about the offensive struggles, it's nobody's fault outside of mine, Blake Bortles says. 17 rushing yards. That's for Blake. not true, though. It's not total. It's not his fault. Blake, you're a good guy, but come on. There's, it's the rest of your team's fault. It's not your fault. In, you know, you're not the entire team out there. I know you're the only player that's worth a, a, a penny, but you know, you're not the only one um, for a win or a loss. So, mm. Raider running back Latavius Murray, 22 yard run. A touchdown run in the Raiders' win Sunday. So those are your night's notables. And now, news and notes from the world of UCF sports. This week, the war on I-4 has officially begun. Uh, a season-long quest to strengthen the intensity of the rivalry between UCF and the Cows, with a trophy being awarded to the school that racks up the most wins in head-to-head -head competition. Have you seen the trophy? It looks like an I-4 sign. Yeah, it's, it's like interesting. It. This like is it. long overdue, and it's good for the fan like bases. Yeah. On that note, solid start for volleyball. Home sweeps over Memphis and the Cows. The Knights are now 2-0 in the American, 12-3 uh, overall. The win over the directionally challenged school from Tampa worth 
three points in the war on I-4 competition. Men's soccer lost 2-1 to one to the Cows and as American play began on Saturday at the UCF Soccer Complex. Earlier in the week, the Knights also lost 2-1 to one against North Florida. UCF now is 0-1 in the American and 1-5 and overall. The Cows picked up six points with the soccer victory and now lead 6-3 in the early going of the quest for the trophy. Boo. Men's golf gets its season underway, finishing as the second-place team at the Hartford Hawks Invitational in Connecticut. Sophomore Donnie Trosper earned his first collegiate victory. Congratulations. Cross Country trailed host Florida and Jacksonville to earn a third-place team finish in the Mountain Dew Invitational. Boy, makes me want one. Five years, Andrew, without a Mountain Dew. That's how long I've gone. Women's soccer finished the non-conference slate five and four (laughs) (laughs) with three of the losses to top 10 programs, including a 3-2 loss at number four, Florida. Men's tennis picks up seven wins in the Southern Intercollegiate Championships. Women's golf tied for 10th at the Annika Intercollegiate, which opened Sunday in Kissimmee. Comings and goings, former men's basketball coach Donnie Jones, my favorite person, (laughs) named a college scout for the NBA's Los Angeles Clippers, while former former UCF Athletics Director Todd Stansbury is now the AD at Georgia Tech after just a year as the AD at Oregon State. I wonder if he's messed up uh, Oregon State as much as he messed it up here wow not a big fan there hey quick shout out uh outside of news and notes ucf wakeboarding i get this from my friend scott morrow over at the recreation and wellness on ucf's campus ucf wakeboarding wins a national championship second time in three years three of the last four titles have been won by the knights and i also have to mention a shout out to rec and wellness 250 students joined the uh, pool party yesterday watching the fiu game Watching in inner tubes, watching the game on a big screen in the pool. That sounds fun. That's not bad, huh? Heck yeah, man. That would be a blast out there doing that. All right, Trace, I think that's going to do it for us. This has been episode number 81. Make sure you join us next week, uh, Saturday at uh, 3.30 for Post Game Live on Rabble.tv. I'm Andrew Fegley. I'm Trace Trolko. Go Knights! Charge on. With our spirits, we'll never yield. Black and gold charge right through the light. Victory is our crown.